Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's nice. Uh, it's nice to be here. Just a one small correction. Our brother Keith mentioned uh, this uh, phrase, the Leviticus. What was it that you, you said? The, the happy book. The happy book. Oh. Yeah, small correction. It was the Leviticus is fun. Oh, sorry. Leviticus. So I went through the book of Leviticus at the home assembly a few years back, and that was. I really mean it. I mean, to me, Leviticus is a fun book to study. And by the end of the study, I think some others agreed with me as well. I'm not sure everyone did, but that's the same thing. Let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord's guidance. Father in heaven, we come before you uh, without strength to understand your word. Only through your spirit do we have any hope of knowing what it is that you say in it. There's so much more than just history or things that uh, the Lord said. Um, What your spirit reveals to us is the truth. And we ask that this morning, Father, by your spirit alone, we would grow to appreciate our Savior, the Lord Jesus, maybe more than we have before. Maybe appreciate him the way he truly appreciates us, though we don't deserve it. So, our Father, we ask your blessing. And your help in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So I'd like to just read a few verses to begin. As believers, we have a great hope in the future. We talk about heaven all the time. My girls, one was saved recently in February and was baptized in February in the cold. It was very cold. Um, But she was asking so many questions about heaven. And now my other little girl is asking a lot of questions and a lot of questions about heaven. In uh, Revelation 21, we read famous verses. We all know them. We we, we read them all the time. The time that we look forward to in verse 4 of chapter 21. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall... There be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. You go back a little bit to Revelation chapter 2, and we read to the church of Ephesus, he says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Literally a pleasure park, paradise of God, something that we all, as believers, have a hope and we look forward to. We can consider other things regarding heaven that we think of. First Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We can go back further in the book of Romans. There's many reasons we have this great hope of heaven. Philippians chapter 3 tells us we're citizens of heaven. I think the King James used the word our conversation is in heaven. It means our citizenship is in heaven. You know, we look at, you know, maybe you're a citizen of the United States. We probably all, we all are here. And I don't know that for sure, but maybe we, we all are. And you see more and more as time goes on, you don't feel the same kind of um, belonging as maybe we did in the past. As things deteriorate around us, I don't worry. I wake up in the morning and I think I'm a citizen of heaven. Romans chapter 8, other reasons that we consider and makes heaven such a desire of our hearts. In Romans chapter 8, verse um, 18, we read this, For I reckon... That the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Maybe you suffer a great deal. Maybe there's great tragedies in your life. And you long for the day when these sufferings will be a thing of the past. And the glory that will be revealed in us will make those sufferings diminish to nothing. Or maybe you suffer on a daily basis. You know, I'm thinking, I've got... You know, infirmities of my own body. I wear these glasses and I can't even figure out which glasses do I bring up to speak up here. Because if I wear these, I can read my Bible. I can't see any of you. If I wear these, I can see you, but I can't see the Bible. (laughs) And, uh, you know, this is a minor, you know, almost insignificant. It is an insignificant infirmity, but maybe your life 
our brother Keith, who has suffered with uh, infirmity of the flesh, for of the body, for so long. Verse 22 of Romans 8, we read, For we know that the whole creation groaneth, and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. Ephesians 1 will talk about the redemption of the purchased possession, referring to our very bodies that will one day be freed from the bondage of sin. Romans 7 has a lot to say about that as well. A couple of verses to look at further. I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul writes, We can look at 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul is carried up into the third heaven and talks about the wonderful things that he's seen, such things that he's heard that is not lawful, he says, for man to speak. He's referring to the, when he says not lawful, and for the young ones I'll I'll say, he's not saying that you're breaking the law and they're going to put you in jail. Uh, Paul wasn't afraid that they would put him in jail if he revealed the things that God had showed him when he was carried up into heaven for a time. Uh, he's talking about like the law of gravity would be, I think, where it wasn't able. He's not able with the flesh of our tongues and our uh, mind and the language as we understand it now to communicate the things that God had shown him. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I want to hold your hand here. I'd like to go to 1 Thessalonians now. Go the wrong way. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We think of heaven and our hope. Maybe you have loved ones there as we do. And you wait for that reunion. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we. You know, your loved ones are going to be there with you who, are, who have been saved. To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words, he says. And finally, I'd like to, not finally, but Philippians chapter 1. We read in Philippians chapter 1, where Paul writes this. I'll start in verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I don't know. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. These last three scriptures I'd like to focus on a little bit more. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 5 again. I'm just going to quote it. He doesn't say... It is, you know, I'm going to read it because I, I'm going to read what he doesn't say. That's strange, isn't it? Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. What he doesn't say is this. And willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present in heaven. Did you notice that? He doesn't say that. He says... We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You go to the First Thessalonians verse, First Thessalonians chapter 4. He does not say, in verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, To be with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be in heaven. Doesn't say it. He says, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
And finally, Philippians. I keep saying finally, but I know you wish it were finally, but we got a ways to go. Colossians, Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. He says, verse 23, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart, he doesn't say, and to be in heaven. He says, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. When you think about the difference between the two, we, we, all, we often think as believers almost synonymous. It's not how the world thinks of it. You talk to people in the world, my family suffered a tragedy recently, and it's almost depressing additionally when you hear people come to us and say, oh, your son, he's in a better place. Oh, yeah, we know that, but that's not what gives us comfort. My son is with the Lord. You see, the world thinks of heaven as this wonderful place, but I've never, ever, ever once heard someone in the world say they wanted to be with the Lord. What is it that drives Paul or us to say this? I'm here, he's here on earth and he's living to say, I am in a strait betwixt two. That's a fight within himself. I want this, but I need this. He says, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart, to die, and to be with Christ which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. He's, he's, he's caught. I want this because I want to be with Christ. The world doesn't think this. The religions of the world do not think this. They think about heaven. Oh yes, heaven. Oh, I hope I can get there. I hope that uh, I can, I can meet, meet the requirement. I try my best so I can be in heaven. mm mm having a desire to depart and to be with Christ. I'd like to look at and explore some of the reasons as believers and as what we understand this to mean or why we come to this realization. It's not heaven that we're after. It's being with Christ that we're after. And we see some examples. If you go to the book of Luke and the things that God reveals in his interactions with certain people, and hopefully we'll have time to get through a few of them, some extreme cases. If you go to Luke chapter 7, I'd like to read this story here of the Lord's interaction with this woman. And verse 36, 736, the story begins. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of wine. I want to stop for just a minute. For those who may not know, this was a euphemism to say the woman was a sinner. It was telling us that she was a woman of the, of the evening. I'll leave it at that. And she brought, it says, an alabaster box of ointment, in verse 38, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who... And what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he, the Lord Jesus here, said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And then he, the Lord, turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, 
Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Now we have to stop there. The confu- the, uh, the, some of the more modern translations, I think, are clearer in this portion here. The context makes it very, very clear to us. The Lord Jesus is not saying here at all that, look how much she loves me, therefore she's forgiven. The next verse goes on to say this. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. What the passage is telling us is that look at what she's doing. Look at the love she's showing me. Look at what ends she has gone to, to show and demonstrate this love to me. That is the evidence that she had been forgiven. The passage makes it clear with the debtor and the way the Lord told the story. And sometimes I said the more modern translations make that more clear. But he shows that this woman loved him because she had been forgiven. Now, go back a little bit to the story. In the story, and look at, say, verse 30, uh, 37. Of Behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of wood. Here's a woman who had some prior encounter with the Lord Jesus. She knew that he had forgiven her. He spoke to her at some point in the past. She knew that she was forgiven. There was no question in her mind about her sin, about what she was, and consider what she was. And I want to be careful in my language. She's a woman who knew what it was like to pretend to love. She knew what it was like to be around men who were not loyal to their families, Perhaps this woman had been the cause of families breaking up. Who knows? Perhaps in her life, like it's common, we hear in modern days, people who are involved in serious sin reach a point in their life where they think, it's too late for me. About 25 years ago, I had a conversation with my own father where in tears he told me, Joseph, he said, it's too late. After things I've done, I could never be saved. 25 years later, he still believes that. If he even thinks about it anymore. Perhaps there's someone here who has felt that way or does. Here's a woman perhaps who felt that way. But she encountered the Savior. And at some point... He made it known to her that she was forgiven. Her faith, he said at the end of this story in verse 50, hath saved her. She trusted him. She heard of him. She went to find him. And now that she's been forgiven, in the house of a Pharisee, this is not someone who opened their doors, at least not publicly, or or, uh, uh, for everyone to know, would let a woman like this into the house. But nothing was going to keep her away from the Savior. She worked her way in. Who knows what crowd there might have been outside that door that day. And she weaseled her way and she got in there. Nothing was going to keep her away. She wanted to be with him. And there was an opportunity and she took it. She went there and she couldn't stop herself from demonstrating how much she loved him because of what he had done for her. Changed her. Not a disloyal man like she had been familiar with. Not someone who knew how to lie. Someone who truly knew what love is and no more pretending in her. This was real love. Forgiving your sins. You may not have, you may not be a sinner like this. But you think back and I think if you consider just what sin is and how grotesque it really is. Oh, I'm very tempted to go back and talk about the leper in Leviticus chapters uh, 14 and 15. 
The leper, when he was cleansed, I guess I will. The leper, when he was cleansed, one of the things, he would be all white. And you think, oh, he's white. And the, one of the reasons that the, that the priest could then pronounce him clean, you're clean. But if you know anything about leprosy, it destroys the body. And that person, he may have been cleansed, but his body was grotesque. The look of that man for the rest of his life would be grotesque. But then we have verses like in Colossians in chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, where the Lord Jesus, we learn that because of what he's done for us, for the sinner, what it says is we are holy, made unblameable, and without reproach. We, uh, I'm going to read it so you can hear exactly what it says. My mind, my, my uh, memory fails sometimes. Colossians. Holy, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable, it says, in his sight. We are grotesque in our sin. But our Lord Jesus, when he cleanses us, when he comes and when you go by faith to him and call out to him and say, Lord, save me. Oh, nothing, nothing is better. And he will save you. And no longer are you grotesque in his sight. Oh, you might be grotesque. You may have consequences to live with and wreckage in your life. Others that you knew in the past may look at you and never see anything good in you, but not to him. To him, you are unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. Amen. We learn of his forgiveness in John 4.10. He says, herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Our brother talked about his sacrifice earlier. And we remembered it this morning in the first meeting. What a sacrifice it was. What a huge price he paid. So that we could be forgiven. If that doesn't move you in desire to be with him. Forget about heaven to be with him, then brothers and sisters, something's wrong. First Peter 2.24 talks about how the Lord Jesus died, uh, gave his, own, his life for our sins, suffered on the tree. I'm, I'm not going to try and quote it. You can look it up. What a tremendous Savior we have. Another story. Let's go over. I go back and forth whether I should look there. Let's go to Mark. Mark chapter 5. You can read this story in Luke chapter 8 too, but just something about Mark chapter 5, the account in Mark chapter 5, I, I want to go through this morning. And they, verse 1, Mark chapter 5, verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, the Lord Jesus and his disciples, or a few of his disciples, in the country of the Gadarenes. Verse 2, And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. So this is man, he had an unclean spirit, possessed under the power of Satan. He lived in the tombs. He didn't live in a house like we do. He left that. That life was gone. It says, it goes on, And no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stone. Here's a man in a situation that he didn't want to be in, but he couldn't help it. He couldn't help it. It was no use blaming him at this point. Maybe there was a time and he got involved in things. Who knows? But right now, there was nothing that could be done. They tried to help him. They would bind him for his own good, you know, tie him up, put chains on him even for his own good because he was cutting himself. He was 
in the tree, uh, in the in the tombs, living in the among the dead. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying. Can you imagine that? Not able to help it, cutting himself with stones. Just get out. You can. You can. Nothing. Couldn't help himself. Desperately wanted it. Wanted to, and no one could help him. You can almost see in the next verse, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Something, you know, he had control. He was fighting for control. And occasionally, apparently, it would seem, there was some kind of control. Or maybe it was... And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? This would be the demons in him speaking. I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. So now this demons within this man, controlling this man for the most part. Crying out to the Lord, don't torment me. Speaking for themselves. Obviously don't care about the man that they've been tormenting. Verse 8, for he said unto him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. That's what the Lord Jesus had said. And he asked him, these would be the, the, the Lord Jesus, says, what is your name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. And these demons have a concern for themselves, whatever that means. Verse 11, now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding pigs. And all the devils besought him, saying, send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 pigs, that is. And were choked in the sea. I don't know if that means there were also 2,000 pigs devils in this man but whatever there were they did to the pigs exactly what they had been doing to the man causing them causing him to destroy himself against his own will I see this man and I think how he's crying and cutting himself with stones none of us here I would suspect have ever been in such a situation where this extreme has afflicted you, where, you know, you just can't help it. You don't want it. Of course, there's to some degree. We lose control of ourselves in various situations, but I doubt to this kind of extreme anyone in this room has ever suffered this kind of thing. But now the man is freed. And the pigs he they destroyed, exactly like I said they were going to do to this man, they had been doing to this man. Verse 14 says, And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city, in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus, and they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. I'm thinking, why were they afraid? Hadn't they tried to help this man? They failed in helping the man. They tried hard to help him. Let's not, you know, give credit where it's due. These men wanted to help him. They couldn't. And now they saw someone who could and did. And they were afraid. Such power made them afraid. Verse 16, they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil. And also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him. To depart out of their coasts. This is where it gets interesting. Think about this. These were people just like us. Those we know, our neighbors, our friends, co-workers. They liked the man. They helped him. They wanted to help him. They tried to help him. And they saw that he was helped. Human being. Restored to a dignity. Clothed and in his right mind. And they saw the man who did it. And they said, depart from me. Go away. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. 
I wonder if you would ask these people that day, if you went after this great event in the swine and you took a poll and said, how many of you, when you, want, when you die one day, want to go to heaven? I suspect every one of them would have said, yeah, of course I do. I want to go to heaven. Who wouldn't? But then they look at the Lord Jesus himself and they say, go away. That's what the world is. They want the place of paradise, but they don't want the person who brings it and gives it. I'm reminded in Luke chapter 5 where Peter was on the boat fishing that day. And you remember the Lord says, throw the net. And he throws one net at least. And they catch all the fish and Peter sees this and He falls down, it says, at the Lord Jesus at his knees. And he says, Lord, he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Does the Lord Jesus depart? Not a chance. Depart from, these men said depart from me. And we read in the next couple of verses that he does just that. He will depart. You want him to leave? Sometimes he will. But in Peter's case, he didn't. Why? Why? Think about it. Peter fell down in confession. Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Peter, not understanding the very reason the Lord Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He wasn't going to leave Peter. And he never did. Not even when Peter departed from him some years later. Verse 14. Oh, I read that already, didn't I? No, I'll read it again. It's all right. No, verse 11, right? Somebody tell me what verse I'm on. <laughs> verse 14. We'll still pick up there. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil. And also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. There you have it. The man who had the demons cast from him. He was saved, wasn't he? And the most natural reaction in the world is he wants to be with Jesus. He prayed him that he might be with him. Now verse 19, how be it Jesus suffered him not? Jesus said no. Essentially saying not just yet. He said, but say to him, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Here's our position. I'm caught. I'm in a strait, says Paul in Philippians chapter 1. I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. He adds, but it's more needful for you that I remain. You know, I've got young children. I'll be honest with you. I would love to depart. I won't lie, I even prayed for them. But I have little ones. And it's necessary, at least for the time that I remain. And tell what great things God has done for me. And you're in the same boat. Every one of you in here, I put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives hope to your life, he gives you hope gives you dignity when maybe you had none. In Colossians chapter 1, he says, delivered, he said, delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of light. How have we been taken from the power of darkness? I doubt any of us have ever been in the position of this unclean Uh, This man with the unclean spirit. This is an extreme. But to some degree, you know, every one of us has been in 
under the influence, the influence of Satan in one way or another. And the Lord Jesus comes and he puts us right. I want to be with him, and I bet you do too. Who cares about heaven? I mean that reverend. I want to be with the Lord Jesus. Paul himself, I think, is a great example. He's the one who said the words. And I think in many cases, Paul is the worst of the examples. Go to Acts chapter 7. I don't want to read everything that happened here. We could spend the whole time just on Paul's life. But you go to Acts chapter 7. This is a story of where Stephen is stoned. Why is he stoned? Well, he's stoned because he's preaching the gospel. And the leaders in the Jewish religion of the time are not happy about it. They don't like it. And we read in the end of this passage, in chapter 7 of Acts, the verse I'll pick up in verse 55. But he being full of the Holy Ghost, speaking of Stephen, when he's being stoned, because they don't like what he's saying about the Lord Jesus. He looks up into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the, eye went, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. That later would be known as Paul, the one who wrote Philippians chapter 1. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeling down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Here's a man who saw the Lord Jesus as he was about to die. He wasn't afraid. He's saying things like, don't lay this sin to their charge. He wants them to be forgiven, just as the Lord Jesus cried from the cross. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do about those soldiers. He sees where he's going and knows it. Into thy hand, he says. Or he says, I don't want to misquote it. He says something very similar to what the Lord Jesus said. In this case, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. From the cross, our Lord Jesus himself cried out to the Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. The most natural thing in the world when somebody is saved over time to start doing things the way the Lord Jesus did. You don't have to try. By sanctification, the process God works in us, he makes us more like his son. And we naturally by the Spirit of God, start doing things without even thinking about it the way his son does. And that's what happened with Stephen in the moments of his death. But the real point is that I'm getting here is the one who is standing by, the young man's feet whose name was, uh, that they laid the coats, whose name was Paul, uh, Saul. Verse, chapter 8, verse 1 of Acts says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. We won't get into that. Here's this man, Saul of Tarsus. Oh, a religious man. Oh, very religious. He, let's look in some other things that he says. Go to Philippians again, but this time in chapter 2. Philippians no, not chapter 2, chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Paul writing this. This is now after he's saved. You could read the story about when he's saved. In fact, I'll just mention it quickly in chapter 9. It's recorded three different times in the, uh, in the book of Acts. But in chapter 9 is the first time. And we, he's, the Lord reveals himself to Saul of Tarsus. And one of the things the Lord Jesus says to him this time, he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul, or, uh, uh, Saul responds, you know, who are you, Lord? Uh, and the Lord Jesus says, I am Jesus, who you persecute. 
It, he adds this little phrase in the, in the account. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I don't want to get into the, you know, all the details of the, the ox goads and all this stuff. But the idea, I believe, is this. Something was troubling Saul of Tarsus about what he was doing. Something was in there. He heard. We just read that he was at the place where Stephen had been stoned. He was there. He saw it. He watched it. He was consenting to it. And he heard all the things that Stephen said. You know, I think it made sense to him. It was stuck in his head. Something made sense of what Stephen had said that day. But this religious heart in Paul, in Saul, I'm just going to call him Paul. That's who his name means who he becomes. He was religious. We read that now in Philippians 3. He tells us about it. Though I might have, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, verse 4, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Here by all his works, all the things that he was compelled to do, to satisfy God's requirement as he saw it, as he understood it, even to the point of persecuting the church. It's he who will write in Romans chapter 11 where he says, concerning zeal, speaking of the Jewish people of that day, they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Paul at that time was like that, religious. He was religious. We've met religious people. Yes, I do my best. I'm doing my best. God, I hope he'll receive me. I'm trying. Doing my part. That's the thing. Paul was that way. Doing his part. But he came to understand. And he'd say things like Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, but which we have done. But by his mercy he saved us. And other things that he writes. Ephesians 2, 8. Brother... Keith was just talking in Ephesians. I'm sure everybody can quote, my little ones can quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I can't, apparently. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'll tell you, of all the examples that we looked at, the sinner, we looked at this man under the influence of Satan, I believe it's the religious person that's in the hardest case. You can't get to them. And not everyone who follows just a religion, you know, a known, you know, all the various religions out there, there are many men, maybe even more, especially in our country these days, who follow their own religion. They make, just make it up as they go along, and they're pretty sure. Oh, I'm not a bad person. Oh, look at this. Look at, what I, look at all these things. Matthew 7, to finish up. You ask them, next time you're talking to a religious person, you want to go to heaven when you die? Oh, they're going to say yes. No, I hope I, go, I hope I get there. They'll definitely tell you that. Ask them then, do you want to be with Christ when you die? Well, you know, I'm not sure about that. I don't know who he is really. They send him away. The way those gatherings did, without even realizing he is the Savior. You want heaven? What does he say? Matthew uh, in uh, John 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But you get to the religious folk. You look at chapter 7, verse 21 of Matthew. This is what the Lord Jesus says. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, there isn't time to go into the details of that. But you know who it is to do the will of the Father, which is in heaven? The first command, to trust the Son, to put your faith in Him, because there is no other way. You can't do anything that God requires of you until you have the Holy Spirit in you and you get that through trusting the Lord Jesus, who gave His life for you, and then rose from the dead. 
Not, verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, and listen carefully to what they say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works or mighty works. And when I, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Look at what they do. They go to, the, we, this is going to happen. Individuals, I hope not a single person in this room. There are going to be individuals who stand before the Lord Jesus one day saying, Lord, what do you mean? Look at all that I've done for you. Look at it. I cast out demons in your name. I prophesied in your name. Look at this. All the wonderful works that I've done for you. Not by works, lest any man should boast. And he's going to say to them, depart from me. Just like the Gadarenes had said to him. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, you quoted it three times this morning, and you've never, I don't think you once quoted the start of it. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I have to wonder, when Paul wrote those words, was he thinking about that thief on the cross? He'd heard it. It wasn't written yet, perhaps, but he heard it. He knew the story. The thief on the cross hanging there, and he says, Lord, remember, literally being crucified with Christ, the thief on the cross. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Matthew, uh, Luke chapter 23. Lord, remember me when you come into thy kingdom. Think about what is implied in that statement. Here's a man never done a work in his life. For all we know, wasn't you know a demon possessed or anything like that. Was a sinner for sure. To say those words, he had to know that the Lord would be right, would raise from the dead. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. How much of it he understood is doubtful. You know the bodily resurrection things. Oh, I, I don't know. Probably not very much. But what he knew is it wasn't the end for the Lord Jesus. He knew that that man, the Lord Jesus, was king. He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He knew that the Lord Jesus, that king, had authority to give him citizenship. Just like we have. Remember in Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven. And the Lord Jesus, his response, I think some of the most beautiful words in all of God's word. Today, you will be with me in paradise. It's not heaven. With me. I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, it is more needful, he says, Paul, that I remain with you. Our Father, we thank you so much for your Son, Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, our heart's desire, Father, is to be with Him. You gave your, He gave His life for us. You sent Him. You didn't create our need. We departed from you, sinners under the influence of Satan, trying to work our own way. What mercy! By your mercy, you saved us. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for his obedience to you and willingness to endure that horrible cross. So that we could be with him forever and enjoy those words that he says to his disciples. That where I am, there ye may be also. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much. Bless us as we go our way that we would desire, as we ought to, to be with your Son. 
And we all certainly look forward to that wonderful day. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.